we are continuing. We're, we're, we're at the second to the last topic within our core value series here at Reach. And I, I pray that as we've walked through these things, that you're starting to get kind of a, a larger picture of how we live life in order to fulfill what Christ has called us to do and to be as a local church. And all these things, they kind of weave themselves together to accomplish that. So we, we exist as a church to show the love of Christ to people, like one community, one family, and one person at a time. And, and we do that by doing these things. And it's inward here because if we get things wrong in-house, we don't want to share that with anybody. Amen? So, so in order for us to love with the love of Christ, it's, it starts kind of at home and then it's freed up to go out into your spheres of influence. And, and these are things are vastly important because, because if it was just about trying to get people to come to an arbitrary location for an hour every Sunday, it wouldn't be a big deal. We just get somebody that's a way better speaker than I am and we would just just like figure out like what are the draws of things rather than like what we're offering God and community you'd be like hey it's goldfish Sunday everybody come and get a free goldfish right People like oh free goldfish sweet I'll go to church for that or you know, it's a parachute drop of all kinds of candy on Easter we'll show up for that right that'd be awesome no <laughs> it's, it's not we, we, we are to show people what, what the truth is. And I don't want us not being squared away in-house. And I don't want us to have kind of a shtick to get people in here. It's all about showing people who Christ is and loving them as he showed and told us how. Amen? Amen means we agree. Amen? Amen. So today, I just want to start things off with this uh, second to last uh, within the core values series of We Go. And I want to start this off by, by letting you guys into a little bit of insight. Um, I have no business being up here. Okay? I have no business being God's representative. I really don't. Because... I'm just some guy that that has lived a life that in and of itself is not pleasing to God. Apart from Christ, I, I've done no good thing, which means everything in my life is tainted, even if I tell people the truth of Jesus Christ. I have no business being up here. But, but, God saved me. And then God called me and he said, yo, Dave, I know what you've done, but here's what I'm leading you into in life. I'm like, you got the wrong guy. How many of you say that? When, 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 you, when you sense God leading you into something and you're like, you have the wrong person, Lord. I'm shy or I'm afraid or I'm too short, or I'm too tall, or I don't, I don't know. We, we come up with a myriad of excuses, don't we? But you have the wrong person, God. Call somebody else. Tell somebody else to go do this, because you have the wrong guy. And, and we're partly right, because in and of ourselves, we don't have anything good to represent God with. But because of what Christ has done, because of the righteousness that he imparts and imputes into our lives, we then can be ambassadors for the kingdom wherever God calls us to. Amen? I know there's, I know there's people gone today, but, but you can be an ambassador for God wherever he calls you into. Amen? That's why I can be up here today. It's not because I'm anything special in and of, in and of who I am naturally. There's nothing special about me. 
I know my mom's going to argue about that, but there really, there really isn't. But it's the fact that, that, that God has done a transformational work in the life of everybody that has put their faith in Christ. And then he calls them according to his will and his purpose. And when he does that, wherever you go in obedience to that, do you think you're not, you shouldn't be there? Do you think you shouldn't be there? God did this miraculous work in there. You were a new creation. And he says, okay, uh, Bob, I want you to stop farming and I want you to go to Timbuktu, Africa. Or, or Dave, Dave, you're no longer going to be at National Pawn. You're going to Timbuktu with Bob. <laughs> that's not a real thing. That's a hypothetical. So anyway, but if God calls you to that and you discern that he's said, this is what I want you to do, what do you do with that? Because sometimes we're like, oh, God, I, I just couldn't. I can't. I'm too afraid. I'm not good enough. I'm not... I, I wouldn't know what to say. I wouldn't know how to act. I wouldn't. God says, you're right. In and of yourself, you wouldn't. But I'm calling you there. And I want you to follow me in obedience and in trust so that my will will be accomplished through you wherever I'm leading you. And so this, this value of going it's going to kind of dovetail into a couple other things that we've talked about with discipling and, and witnessing and multiplying. But this morning we're going to take a little bit of a different kind of approach on it because it's the, it's the hardest part of the inertia of someone that's called to go make disciples. You guys know what inertia is, right? That's like a physics term, but it also is applicable to life. So inertia says that a body at rest tends to stay at rest. Right? For those of you that are still working on that New Year's resolution of getting to the gym or whatever, you know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm right there with you. And then once the body is in motion, when you get some movement and you start seeing this is not just potential, this is possible and this is actual, what tends to happen then? You stay in motion. And going requires us to start in motion. And just let me ask you this. How do you guys move? Think of the simple answer. How do you move? With your feet. Amen? You guys move around with... I know some people like, my car. Well, how did you get your car? Oh, I walked there. Okay. So we get around by move, like literally moving with the feet that God has blessed us with. This morning we're going to be looking in Romans chapter 10. The, the verses that our core value is anchored to is verses 13 and 14 in Romans 10. But we're going to be looking at a larger portion of that, that passage so we can get a little bit more context for uh, what Paul is, re is referencing this morning about movement and about what our feet not only enable us to do but the, the the great blessing that it is that we can actually move with them and where where God is calling us to be and so this morning the Apostle Paul he had this biblical word that he associated with, with feet in Romans 10 15 we're gonna look at that in just a second here um, and it's also written this is something that he is referencing out of the Old Testament from the, the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was a prophet to Israel. And Paul is seeing the same things that the prophet of Israel is, is needing to tell the people then and there. He's like, I have to do this now to the Gentiles because they're in the same boat. They're, they're in the same position. It's just in a different context. And so Paul... And it's inspired, so Paul's not stealing anything. God is saying this in a couple of different places. But Paul is, is, is referencing 
feet and movement out of Isaiah 52 7 and this is what it says it says how beautiful which is not what you think of when you think of feet usually right how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news who proclaim peace who bring good tidings who proclaim salvation who say to Zion your God reigns how did Paul arrive at the same biblical conclusion as Isaiah 700 years later the short answer is God breathed that into what Paul was writing to the church in Rome but in Isaiah Isaiah had the same message that he's bringing that, that Paul is bringing as well that, that that God reigns and you need to acknowledge that and you need to understand how your life falls under submission to that because if God reigns that means we don't right I used to get mad about that no I want to reign I, if I, I found out how bad I was at that <laughs> terrible at it I don't want to reign at all but Isaiah in his context he saw Israel and Israel had sold themselves to the idols of the world and had become this faithless and this rebellious group towards God the nation including its leaders had lost the vision of God's kingdom and of God's righteousness they lost this idea of love and peace and what they were doing was they were actually serving the 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 gods small g of materialism self-indulgence hypocrisy and immorality does that sound kind of familiar <laughs> right i'm not picking on anybody that's just the fallen human condition and isaiah comes under the scene as a prophet sent by the God that reigns amen and what does he say he goes to he takes God's word and he takes it to God's people and, and, and he foretells the coming of the Lord Jesus he talks about salvation and Paul then takes that and he sees us 700 years later and he's inspired by God as the role of an apostle as a messenger of the Savior to point towards what Christ has done and in the passage we're gonna look at there are some salvation essentials and I'm gonna cover this and some of you are like we've heard this but it's so vastly important that we remember these things that are the foundations for what allows us to call ourselves Christ followers like we got to nail that down because we're in a culture now where people just kind of take for granted that a word means something and a lot of times it doesn't necessarily mean something it's just an identifier and sometimes like because I've talked to people and they'll say I'm a Christian and I'm like what does that mean and a lot of times it's to the negative it means I'm not a Buddhist or an animist I'm not an atheist I don't subscribe to Islam I'll say but but not being those things doesn't mean you are something else that you're claiming or people that just kind of try to identify as Christian by where they arbitrarily kind of show up on a Sunday morning as long as it doesn't go over an hour sorry about that we're gonna right or if the music's good enough or the 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 the, the coffee was the way I like it brewed and, and Dave kind of keep it kind of peppy don't bring us down too much we don't want to hear about that sin stuff too much so people are calling themselves Christians by what they do which is not the foundation of the gospel and so this morning there are some salvation essentials that we're going to look at and there's some new thank the Lord there are some new believers sitting in the room here today there's some new lives in Christ sitting among you today isn't that a wonderful thing you know what that means you know what that means God is at work here 
God is moving into the lives of people that are saying, I want that over everything else that I've experienced in the past. How wonderful is that? Amen? Yes, and this time I'm not going to mention any names because we don't do that. Anyway, but there are some salvation essentials for like the anyone's that Paul is going to be referenced here in knowing the salvation of the Lord Jesus and having then, once you are saved, having these beautiful feet after that. And in the verses leading up to Romans 10, 15, which we're, we're looking at this morning. So beginning in Romans 10, verse 9, it says this. We're going to break this, this passage down a little bit, and then we're going to move into like the application of things at the end. And so uh, Romans 10, 9, it says, and you can follow along there if you have a Bible in front of you. Uh, you can use that, or if you have a smartphone device, just, just stay off texting and Facebook. Uh, <laughs> but it says this, verse 9, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. little caveat there. Uh, this is, if you are confessing Jesus Christ as Lord verbally in the time and place that Paul is writing to, it'll get you dead. So you darn well better mean it. Okay? It's not like, oh, it's the sinner's prayer that I prayed. I mean, there's implications into that. But when Paul is saying this, you, if you said that Jesus is Lord, it means that Caesar isn't, and it means that the pantheon of gods in the first century Roman world weren't either. Christianity, though, is not sanctioned under Roman religious rule. So if you say that, you meant it, because when you said it, you could be thrown in prison, which is not like prison now, or you would just get dead. You love this Jesus so much, we'll fix you up like we fixed him up. Verse 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Verse 11, as scripture says, anyone, hear it, anyone? Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So two things have to happen for a person or in anyone to be saved. A person has to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That Christ is the one that is the preeminent in all things. Not the nice teacher. Not the guy with the Bible head on the dashboard. It's not that Jesus. It's the one that is preeminent in all things, including your life. And he is the perfect savior to cover the sins of the world, to take on the sins of the world. He is God in the flesh. That's the Jesus. Amen? That we are to have faith in, to believe in. And believe means that you are convinced in your heart that that is true of him. And when you are, then Christ will be evidenced in your life. And if you are a true believer, if you are a true believer, you have been connected to the church, you've been connected here at Reach, and the Lord Jesus, then, he is the foundation for all that we do, but he's also the foundation for who you are. He's the foundation of your life. He's the rock of your salvation. So everything that you do proceeds from him. And it's impossible for Jesus not to be noticed by others in your life because you are connected to him. Anybody here, like, remember when you kind of got, like, like you, you understood your salvation, like, got saved, and people are like, what's up with so-and-so? Like, they used to be, like, the biggest party animals. And all of a sudden, they just, like, I just, I just can't do this anymore. I can't go there. Or you notice how people's language changed? Like, Dave, you used to be kind of salty. What happened? Well, I found out that that language 
wasn't honoring to God and it wasn't building people up around me and it didn't draw anybody to the truth of what Christ does on the cross. But when you are transformed from the inside out, you are saved and you realize how sin had gotten into every nook and cranny of your life and then you realize, but God washed me of that and I don't have to keep going back over to this place or doing this thing that I know is going right back to the pig trough that I was rooting in earlier. God saved me so I don't have to do that. And you're different. And people are like, what's up with that person? I see some people smiling in here because they know what I'm talking about. It's not people that grew up in like the nice Christian homes. It's like the people that just got like yanked out of the, the, the world that they were living in and into a better one. You're connected to Jesus. People are going to notice. And the second thing is that whoever is saved then does what? Coasts? Now, this is not to pick on anybody, but like we get saved, like, oh, good. I'm done. Oh, I'm done. Oh. Like if God, not only if we, if, we re, if we remove the command of God to go out, right, and just say, God does a work in my life, and he, he, and he justifies me because of what Christ has done, and, and it's that good. Imagine if, anybody ever have anybody knock on their door and say you won something? Anybody? Like, Ed McMahon never showed up with the big check. Or if he does, give me a call. We'll, we'll find something to do with that. Anyway, um, or like you, you've seen like people that, uh, I don't know, Lexus had a big deal. Like for Christmas, you can buy your wife a Lexus and they'll put like a big bow on it for an ex additional $500 or whatever. You think they'd throw it in, but I think you have to pay for it. Like, oh, you go and like, oh my goodness. What is the first thing you're going to probably do after you receive that stuff there from somebody that you you like you totally are like this is so much more than I ever thought I would receive from somebody? What do you do? Pay taxes. <laughs> well, you told somebody then, right? You told the IRS, but we, I mean, we're like, yeah, and especially now with social media, people get excited when they get like an ice cream cone. Oh, I got a free ice cream cone. Unbelievable. When people understand their salvation in Christ, and it's so good, we're talking on the eternal, in the eternal scheme of things. We get, we, I mean, you, you look at the promises of God in end times. When we get to be in front of God, and he, just think about this. How much value is there in God wiping the very last tear from your eye when you get into heaven? What is that? Oh, man. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. And you get to be in the presence of God, which was his thought from the beginning until we done screwed it up. Right? Think of the, that gift of eternal life. What do we usually do with that, though, in the church? Oh, I'm done. Oh, good. I don't know if I want to tell anybody this. They're going to look at me weird. Oh, I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I want to do that. But that's not what Paul says. That's not what Jesus says. Paul says that whoever is saved has to call on and profess the name of Jesus. Has to. And gets to. Like, why would you not? Like, look, look what God did in my life. He saved a wretched piece of dirt like me. And now when God looks at me, and I'll hear this, this is the, the extent to what God has done a work in the life of the believer. When God looks at me, he sees the perfection of Christ. What a blessing. So why would we not call on and profess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ?
The Greek word for profess is homologeo, which means with words, with logos, with words. It means that you talk about the word. It means you talk about the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth. And then we're going to look at verse 14. It says, how then can they, that's the anyone's, okay? How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they, like these anyone's, believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone? Here's a scary word for you. And this is not about me. This is about you guys. Ready for it? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now stay with me here. I think maybe I lost you at preaching. You're know, like, Dave, didn't you just get done telling us you shouldn't be up there? Yes, I did. But same goes for every believer. I don't, I shouldn't be in this place. But God is calling me into this place and is making me ready to enter into the thing that he's called me into. So, so, so listen to this. Only those who call on the Lord Jesus that believe in the Lord Jesus and profess the Lord Jesus will be saved. That's correct, yes? Only, only those people. You don't get there through Buddha. You don't get there through following the law. You don't get there by just being a good person because I really haven't found one of those yet. Right? You don't get into salvation without Christ. So you trust Christ as Savior and serve Him as Lord. You hear two different things there? We like the Savior Jesus. But sometimes we have a problem with the Lord part. Which means He He rules. He reigns. He's sovereign. He gets to call the shots. And not only is it me saying, oh gosh, I don't know if I like that. Remember what he just did for you. I found out I couldn't live my life well anyway. So he is now living through me so that I can understand why I can be saved and be saved and what I do with that. And so you trust Jesus as Savior. You serve him as Lord. You receive God's forgiveness on God's terms, which is the gift and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are justified by faith in his work. This also means that no one can call and believe unless they've actually heard the gospel. What are you going to call on? What are you going to seek out? What's going to save you? If nothing, if nothing saves you apart from Christ, what are you going to find that's going to actually do anything of any good? No one can believe without hearing the true gospel of Jesus Christ. The glory of the gospel is that it is a spiritual understanding and occurrence that comes to you by God's Holy Spirit through the hearing of the word concerning Jesus. Okay, that's what it, that's what it is. And it moves us into areas of life that we can't get to without being saved first. Which kind of begs the question, how did I get saved? By hearing. Romans 10, 17, if we move, if you have a Bible in front of you, you move up a couple verses, it says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So another thing that we do, uh, another essential part of understanding the gospel and what it's gonna do in our lives, is is for like these anyone's again that will respond to it is that someone must preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in order for a person to hear to believe and profess in order to be saved and Paul says that they cannot hear or believe and profess unless they again hear from the or a preacher the Greek word is akaruso, and that is something that has to be present in order for gospel transmission, in order for there to be 
salvation in order for there to be movement then in a person's life that accomplishes the will of God. Second Peter 2 5 Peter here describes Noah not as a boat builder which is what we think of him right when you think of Noah and the ark what do you think of cubits <laughs> what was it what else not cupids no <laughs> Cubits, which is this. But we don't know how big Noah was, so when you get to be a few hundred years old, maybe they got a little taller. So I always kind of laugh at the Ark encounter. I'm like, I think it's maybe too small. <laughs> but anyway, Second Peter, yeah, like a lot of you, oh, <laughs> think of that. Uh, but, but listen to this, Noah in Second Peter 2, uh, is not described as a boat builder or an ang animal wrangler, but as a preacher of righteousness. And a preacher, and you, you might have some kind of preconceived ideas about this, but a preacher is not an ordained position. We've created a hierarchy within the church that says there's these offices that our people are appointed to and only they then can be considered a preacher. We talked about this a little bit last week. Yeah, you can go to seminary, that's a great thing. But if you don't, does that mean you can't invest in other people? By no means. A preacher is not an ordained position but rather a preacher is someone who openly, well, now I hear this, a preacher is somebody who openly proclaims something. And in this case, a preacher is someone who openly proclaims something which Christ has done. It's similar to the word profess. You use words and you use faith to express what you believe and why. Now we don't have the spiritual gift of preaching, but we are all to proclaim what Christ has done for us. And it doesn't mean you're standing up on a stool with a bullhorn yelling at people. In fact, I would say that's probably the, the least fruit-bearing thing maybe because if you're, like I've seen, I mean, people need to know about sin, but I think sometimes we get that wrong. We're trying to beat it out of them. I, I like the Jesus approach. He's like, I know what you've done, and I'm not going to condemn you for it right now, but turn from this stuff, or something way worse is going to happen. Right? Because we're supposed to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, because we've set him apart as Lord, and we do so with what? Gentleness and respect. Yelling at people about how fallen they are, I don't know if that's going to help. Let, let's let the Spirit convict people. I don't want to do that. Because I already, like, I, I fall under that myself. Now, if the Spirit says you got to take a hard line on something, then we do that. But all that's to say is if you are a believer, you are a preacher, you are a proclaimer of the truth, you are a professor of Jesus Christ. And then what else has to happen? Someone must send the preacher with the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, people think statistically there are still over 2 billion, that's with a B, okay? There are still two, over 2 billion people in the world and over 6,000 different people groups who have not heard the saving word of the gospel of Christ which is a gospel of justification by faith. And it would have to be that there are maybe not enough people then who are being sent to preach so that the anyones can hear, ask, believe, profess, and be saved. I got news for you. When you think of like 2 billion people and 6,000 unreached people groups, we always go to like Pan Pacific area or 
you know, old Eastern Bloc, you know, Soviet, former Soviet states, or, you know, some place in the deep in the Amazon jungle. I got news for you. You can throw a rock from this building and, and hit people's homes that don't know Jesus either. Don't do that. But <laughs> and that won't, that won't show them the love of God. Why are you throwing rocks at me? It was an illustration. Think of that. Two billion people. And some of them, you're around them all the time. And there are not enough people who are being sent to preach so that people can hear, ask, believe, profess, and be saved. Now listen to this. How many of you wake up in the morning and say, Oh, Lord Jesus, can you just come back now? Anybody? You can be honest about that one. And it sounds selfish, but he said he was coming back, and maybe it's today. How many of you said that, Lord, I can't do this anymore? Can you just come back, please? Jesus will not return until the good news of the kingdom of God is preached to every tongue, tribe, and nation, and then the end will come. That's in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. He's like... We want everybody to hear this before God comes back in His glorious appearing. And then Jesus, what, what does He do then? He, he judges the quick and the dead, right? The, the dead and alive, right? So He wants to give everybody ample opportunity to hear this message of salvation. Now He knows the outcome already. But look at our responsibility in that. I was like, I wake up this morning, I was like, Lord, I wish you'd just come back. Maybe I should go tell more people about you today. Because that's actually hastening the Lord's return. Think about that. Now, I don't want my motivation to be selfish in that. I really want people to know the truth and to live in it. But we have those thoughts. Lord, when you come back, this place sucks. <laughs> He's like, I don't know. Have you told people about how to make it not suck? Right? So let's... Now, now, now those are the essentials. That's the stuff we, 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 we need to understand in order to, to know how salvation works and that there is something that is articulated out of that in our movement. So let's look at this, this function of... Again, beautiful feet sounds weird because I don't... Unless like you have a foot thing, I don't know. Um, feet aren't that beautiful. But beautiful is kind of in a different context there about what the movement of the feet is actually accomplishing, which is to go. So we as a church, Tom, can you back it up one slide there? We uh, as a church are going to what? We we go. You know, we, I mean, so that's where we are today, right? So we as a church, we are going to go. How do you go? I was saved. How do I go? You have beautiful feet. Let's take a few minutes to look at this verse 15. Tommy, you want to kick it back on the scripture slide there. It's such a tremendously critical verse for the church. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And what an absolute incredible truth there is in these words in which God tells us the function, the function, okay? Not the, the appearance, it's the function of beautiful feet. God, this is what he does, God sends out his people with the message of the good news in Christ Jesus, the Lord, to people who would otherwise be doomed to eternal judgment. Remember, because... All have sinned, right? People want to talk about equality in our culture today, but nobody wants to talk about the most obvious way that we're equal. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin deserves death. Death is not just the body ceasing to breathe. It's spiritual death too. 
And if we're separated from God because of our sin, we have an eternal place where we get to contemplate our fallenness and the places where we could have been saved by God for eternity does not sound like a place I want to be, nor do I want anyone else to be it. But God, he shared the riches of his glory for us and to us so that we could bring the gospel to others who have not yet heard. Beautiful feet bring the message, the gospel of forgiveness in Christ. So the feet don't do the talking, just the walking, amen? But you have to move, you have to go, you have to, you, you, you have to move into different spheres of influence, you have to move into different people groups, you have to move into different conversations that you've had before. And beautiful feet carry the mouth's message of what has happened in the heart in salvation. We see that uh, exhibited in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 17. Now listen to this. All of you, can, you can amen this up all you want, okay? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the, this message of reconciliation. Verse 20, listen to it. You're going to hear this preacher reference here now. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. So we represent the kingdom of our God to the kingdoms of this world as though God were making his appeal through us. Paul goes on to say, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Here's how we do this. He, God, made him Christ, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is a beautiful message for us to, to, to look back on and say, oh man, yeah, reconciled to God who to the, the sinner is eternal judgment because they deserve it, and to the saint, it's eternal bliss with him because of what Christ did. I prefer the latter. Amen? So that is the message that we take to people. And the word beautiful in the Hebrew, I want you guys to hear this. The word beautiful in Hebrew is to be adorned or lovingly fitted. Psalm 93.5 says, Your statutes, Lord, they stand firm. Holiness adorns or is beautiful or fitting for your house for endless days. Eternity. Beautiful feet are holy feet. Think about that. Beautiful feet are set apart for the work that God has for them. Holy feet are dedicated to walking in the way of the Lord Jesus and for the Lord Jesus to the glory of God. 1 Samuel 2, verse 9 says that he, God, will guard the feet of his faithful servants. So you're like, well, what if I go out there and I bring this message to people? Oh, what, what's going to happen? Oh, what has God said? It says that he will guard the feet of his faithful servants. It says, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. So why and how does God protect the feet of his godly ones? You, you might have a little bit of an anxiety about that. You might have a little concern about when I take this message of the cross into people's lives. They're going to hear it from me because I moved into it. And I'm going to tell them. Remember that God furnishes us all with all the pieces of protection that we need. And if you've been part of some of the ladies' studies here Recently, in verse uh, Ephesians chapter 6, you see that the verse is about all the, the armor of God that God gives us to defensively and offensively approach all areas of life. It's spiritual battle stuff, right? Because otherwise, you don't need armor. You don't need armor if nobody's throwing anything at you or shooting at you, right? But 
in Ephesians 6.15, it says that you as believer, you have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Of, of peace. So our feet are protected. Think about that. Your feet are protected for the purpose of going into the world with the gospel. Think of, you ever think about it that way? Your feet, God has already said, are, are fitted with these, you know, it's beautiful, you're fitted with these shoes that will allow you to move into the places that God is calling you to with the gospel. I used to think like going and sharing Jesus with people was like when I walked into Wesley's room and it was dark and he had his Legos out. Ah! It's not like that at all. Our feet are protected by God. Who's better at protecting you than God? Our feet are protected by God for the purpose of going into the world with the gospel. And we as a local body called the church are supposed to be dedicated to God and to each other, each one gifted with a spiritual gift to be used in service to each other. And then from that we go out from here with the feet of preparation to share the gospel. Each of us together and individually for the gospel's sake. You're like, well, this sounds just, I mean, it sounds biblical, but sometimes, like, we don't just get drawn into, like, the truth. We have feelings and we have ideas and opinions about things, and we measure what God's word is, and we say, well, I don't know if I want to do that or not. But in Romans 3.15, it mentions the opposite of, of, of beautiful feet after that. So, so there are feet of people that have not been covered and equipped with the righteousness and forgiveness of Christ, okay? In Romans 3.15, this is what that says. It says, verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. So instead of running to people to give them life, it's people running to people to do what? Take life. The people that are not bringing the gospel, the people that are not the beautiful feet, people, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's what it looks like to not be saved. That's what it looks like to to move into, and you've seen it in people's lives, right? They came at you with, with what they wanted, and they like blindsided you, or they smacked you around, or they they, they misused you, or took advantage of you. They, they took and robbed life from you instead of giving it to you, which is God's plan. But the word feet in Hebrew is from the verb meaning to walk along, to go by foot, or listen to this, to teach, to walk. When you say feet, it's, it's not just the physical feet, it's teaching people how to use them. And at Jesus' ascension back into heaven, when the church marks this as ascension day, Jesus called his followers together and in preparing them for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which came after the ascension on the day of Pentecost, Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And baptism, I think water baptism is included in it, but baptism is far more than a water ceremony. Baptism is when the Spirit comes and cleans you. In verse 20, And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And Paul is actually 
interjecting the Great Commission to the church. It's the number one responsibility of being a follower of Christ. It is to teach others to walk along with Jesus. It's people like you. It's people like me with holy, beautiful feet. We teach others to walk with Jesus. That's another word for discipleship. And it's the main function of followers of Christ and the local church body. And the nature of discipleship is that disciples make what? Other disciples. Well, how can they be saved if they've not heard? And how can they hear if nobody's gone to them? You see it? You see how it works? And in the 114 times in which the word church is used in the New Testament, at least 90 of them refer to believers gathering together for mission, encouragement, fellowship, and instruction on how to missionally accomplish what God has called those in the church to do. The local church is a place where the saints are equipped for ministry, it's where your spiritual gifts for the welfare and growth of the church's body are utilized. The local church body is where people carry each other's burdens. Amen? The local church is where saints from whom Christ, for whom Christ died worship their glorious God and Savior together. And again, that's like a future foretaste of glory, right? If you don't like getting together with people in the church, what's eternity going to be like? I got to keep locking the racquetball courts in heaven. I got to go worship with people. But the local church is part of God's redeemed people who live and serve in such a way that their lives and their communities, did you hear that? Their lives and the communities that they go to are transformed by the love and power of God, which is displayed in Christ and demonstrated, you hear it? Moving into and modeling, it's demonstrated by believers who are the church. That's why we have to be careful when people, when people, somebody just says church, I'm like, what are you talking about? Is it what we just described? Or is it the building on the corner with a steeple on it? But the local church right here is where we learn to teach others to walk with Christ by first of all, loving and serving and supporting one another. That's the commitment to a local body of believers in Christ. And it's not optional. The church is God's strategy for reaching a lost world. And it absolutely needs the support of God's people. And that is why the church also takes its message and multiplies itself in different areas. That's why there are church plants. It's like we just couldn't contain the good message over here. We got to go kick some people over there so those other people can hear. No. And that's why there's new believers sitting here today. Let's look and listen back to Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion. And Zion, anybody know what Zion means? It means parched places dried up dried up nasty places okay desert we say to Zion your God reigns and the most beautiful feet ever were those of the best preacher and evangelist ever and that is the Lord Jesus Christ I would have loved to have been there when he was on his three year earthly ministry Imagine hanging out with him for three years straight as one of the disciples. I mean, you just got to see the heart of God, the character of God portrayed directly in front of you because the Son is the image of the invisible God. Amen? And the Lord Jesus, when he came, his feet came from the glory of heaven and walked in Zion, in the parched places of this earth, in order to bring living water. You guys have heard that term before? John uses that living water that, that that bubbles up inside of people and causes you not to be thirsty in life anymore. 
his feet. They were nailed to the cross. I hear this. This is interesting. In order to bring God's peace and salvation to us, his feet became immovable for us so that ours couldn't move. His feet were nailed to the cross in order to bring God's peace and salvation to us. He receives the honor that he deserves when the body of Christ and its individual members bring that message to other people, which is the message that Jesus alone saves. That's the message that Isaiah brings. That's the message that Paul brings, that our God reigns. Believers are not called to be a passive witness. It has been said that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men and women sit back and do nothing. The disciples of Jesus, they, they learn from Jesus. They listen and obey his words. They multiply by making other disciples. And followers of Jesus recognize him as their leader and Lord. And they deny themselves and follow his holy calling to bring the good news which announces the peace and joy of knowing Jesus and that he alone is Lord. And the church's effective calling of the gospel by the will of God is witnessed when the church proclaims the glorified, and here, I love this word, preeminent Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus to all the earth. And that, that is what provides for a holy beauty which is going to last. And do you have that? Are you proclaiming the everlasting beauty of the person whose feet were nailed to the cross for you? May God continue to encourage us and, and tell us how together as well as individually, as empowered by the Holy Spirit and God's Word to be witnesses of our living Savior. Now, but we got to be assured of who we are. Again, we can't bring the good news if we don't have it. We don't believe it. Do, just ask us, do we believe? Do we trust God? Yes. Well, then what do I do with that? Well, you go. Well, where do I go? You know people that aren't saved. You know people that aren't saved. If you don't, you need to get into the circle of different people. Maybe as you're thinking about this today, maybe write their names down. Maybe pray, God, give me the names of people who I need to go to to share this message of life and hope to. And then pray, Lord, how do they need to hear this from me. And when we get to them and we start having those conversations, will you tell them the truth that will set them free from the sin in their life and provide for an eternal existence with Jesus? Because that is what we're called to do with our salvation. It's to go and provide life, not take it. And that's what the world does. It, it just seeks to capitalize on, on other people instead of sacrificially being there for them. As it, that's what we need to be about as a church, is going to people with the hope of Christ. And so we're going to have a word of prayer. And then we're going to close in a, a final song. But I want you to, to take seriously this missional call because, again, we can't, we can't share the love of Christ if we don't know him. And we can't share, even if we do know him, we can't share with people that don't know if we don't go to them. And Jesus calls it. And it's not just, it's like, to Jesus, it seems like spiritual homework or something. No, it, it is a blessing. Remember the gift that you received a new life? You get to share that with other people. And when you see... The, you guys have been there when this has happened, right? Like, 
this last week, somebody said, the, the, the weight has literally been lifted off my shoulders. And you can see it. It's a privilege to be able to go in the name of Jesus. You get to be an ambassador for Christ. And so let's pray about this. And then we're going to close in some worship. God, I thank you so much for your calling in this. Lord, I know you could have picked a better person or people. You could, you could have done something else. But Lord, you wanted us to be part of what you are doing to reconcile a broken world to yourself. And Lord, even if the outcome isn't what we expect, that's okay. Because the outcome that we want to have is to be found lovingly obedient to you. And as we do that, God, I pray that there are more people here as we move forward in your time and in your kingdom, God, because we followed you by faith and in your protection. And we went out and we told people the truth of Jesus. And the, the numbers were added to the kingdom daily. Lord, if, if we're afraid to do this, God, give us your spirit because you have not given us a spirit of fear or timidity at all. But of courage and a sound mind, God. So, so when we go with you to proclaim you, we do it with courage. And we do it with straight thinking. God, we don't need to be worried about this. And you're protecting us as we move to honor you and the lives of other people. So God, help us to be about this. Put those names in our, in our minds and on our hearts, Lord, that we would reach for you. That we would go to them and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. And God, I just thank you for today. I pray that we leave different, encouraged, strengthened, and spurred on for what you've called us into, God. Lord, I just pray these things in Jesus' name. All of God's people responded by saying, Amen. I'm going to close.